I told Rebecca this morning that my opening line of the sermon comes from the Wednesday text study and her very lips. Don't you just love this guy, Thomas, right? He's just an everyman. Every person who has ever had honest questions, open doubts about faith. I mean, if Judas can be known forever as the betrayer, if Peter can be known forever as the denier, if Pilate's name is cursed every time we say the Apostles' Creed, well, then little wonder that Thomas is famous or maybe infamous for his challenge. He says, show me. Show me Jesus. Show me it's really him who's returned from death to life. Until then, Thomas says, I'm not going to believe it. So it's doubting Thomas now and forever. Poor guy, right? Well, to back up a little bit to this story, Mary Magdalene, faithful Mary, has set the stage here. The gospel says that Mary has met the risen Christ near the tomb that first Easter morning, that she's run and told the disciples what um, was said to her. Mary Magdalene is the first witness, according to John, of the resurrection. Mary's the first evangelist to share the good news of Jesus risen for all the world. She is the first person that God has trusted with the good news, right? And then there's those disciples. They're so frightened by what it might mean that Jesus is risen from the dead, so fearful of facing the same fate of crucifixion at the hands of Roman and Jewish authorities. What do they do? They lock themselves away, right? So you have faithful Mary Magdalene and fearful disciples. And then, and then, the once dead, now risen Jesus suddenly shows up. Lesson says he doesn't bother knocking, doesn't bother with locks and doors, and suddenly Jesus is just standing there. And if you can believe it, if you can believe it, there are no words of condemnation for their betrayal or their denial or their fear. What comes out of Jesus' lips is simply a word of peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, he says the second time, right? He comes with a heart full of forgiveness, a lung full of the Holy Spirit, and a mission that he gives them to get out there and act not like the disciples, but act like Mary Magdalene. Go and tell. Go and tell the good news, right? Trouble is, or maybe it's good news for us, the news is that Thomas isn't there. I always figure that he's sort of like a good Lutheran. He's, he's taken a coffee break. <laughs> he's just tried to put some space between himself and his scaredy cat brothers in the faith. But when he does show up, when they tell him what happened and who they saw standing right there, right over there. Well, that's when Thomas becomes infamously famous, right? In common English, we might say Thomas hears their story and he says, yeah, right, right? Unless I see, unless I touch, unless, 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 I won't believe. I won't. And you can't make me. Right? In the story, it seems that only Jesus can help Thomas believe. Only the risen Jesus in the flesh or whatever form this is that he's in. But here's the thing about Thomas. We know that he's famous for his doubting. But at this moment, Thomas isn't a doubter. He's an unbeliever. He refuses to believe any of this. He simply wants and needs to experience what Mary Magdalene and the other disciples have already experienced for themselves. He wants Jesus right here, right there, standing, talking, looking like the Jesus before Good Friday. I think he should be known really as Thomas, the not going to believe it yet person. 
right? But here's the thing, a good thing about this story. Jesus does show up a week later. Same house, just like before. Everybody's there, but Judas, of course. The doors are shut tight again. Fear seems to still rule the hearts of all the disciples. And then Jesus stands right there again. Same gift of peace. Peace be with you, he says. It's the same Jesus. And then, step by step, Jesus walks Thomas through his doubts and his unbelief. Jesus holds out his nailed hands, lifts up his shirt, and tells Thomas, go ahead, touch the wounds, right? Jesus tells Thomas to put aside his fears, his unbelief, his doubts, and that seems to be enough for Thomas. He doesn't touch, but we learn that his heart and his soul and his faith are touched by Jesus. And he makes that very first confession of faith that counts so much. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Right? And it seems that the breath of the Holy Spirit is still in the air a week later. And Thomas, the unbeliever, becomes believing, trusting Thomas. As a favorite author of mine from the 70s and 80s, probably 90s, Frederick Buechner writes about Thomas, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. I like that. That's helpful for me to hear. Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. The full quote is this. Whether your faith is that there is a God or that there is not a God, if you don't have any doubts, you're either kidding yourself or asleep. Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep our faith awake and moving, right? You did see this, right? Jesus does not chastise or condemn Thomas for his hesitation. He doesn't shame him for his unbelieving doubts. Nor does Jesus do that with us when we struggle with faith, right? I think with Rebecca, it's okay that we love Thomas as being one of us when it comes to facing challenges of faith too. Thomas is an honest realist about his own and about our challenges. You gotta like that about the guy. But here's the other thing about the story, and this is Beekner again. To call this story Doubting Thomas misses the point of the story. The story is not about Thomas' doubt and skepticism. It's about the abundant grace of Jesus who meets Thomas where he's at, meets Thomas' demands point by point in order to move him from unbelief into faith. I'll wait. <laughs> so, you and I would like that same kind of blessing, right? Point by point, Jesus standing right here, right here, addressing every one of our struggles. But we aren't first century. We aren't that first generation of believers. It's true, we don't get that same chance to see Jesus in the same way. For them back then, seeing, touching, Hearing all that helped them to believe in this put to death, risen back to life, Jesus Christ, right? But in this story, in the story from John, Jesus gives us another blessing instead. He says simply, blessed are those, that's us now, blessed are those who have not seen but have still come to faith, come to believe, come to trust anyway. Back then they saw with their very eyes. Now we see with our very ears, right? Paul says, faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. It's why people like Tom and I preach and teach, right? Let's see if I can find what John said. 
Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. And faith now comes from what we hear from preachers and teachers and from one another when we share our stories of faith, right? Beekner one more time. Even though Jesus said the greater blessing is for those who can believe without seeing, it's hard to imagine a believer anywhere who wouldn't want to trade places with Thomas and be given the chance to see that face of Jesus, to hear that voice of Jesus, and to touch those ruined hands, right? There's just something about the way Jesus carries himself, the way Jesus carried his cross, the way Jesus carries us. I suspect you and I will be antsy (laughs) and wondering until that great day comes when we too see Jesus face to face. Amen. Amen. And peace of God, which passes our understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.